And this inspired Insider.com interview with Dana and Andy from the foundation. If you've ever had limiting beliefs or felt like something was holding you back in life and business, you need to listen to this. If you've ever felt lonely in an entrepreneurial world or you just think differently, they talk about it in this. They talk about everything from their big why. Andy talks about what's holding him back uh, since childhood until age 25. We t- Dane talks about Stanley and Stanley and the foundation. Every part of us can relate to what Stanley goes through and what he was thinking and what Dane helped him realize was coming from when he was 14 years old. I mean, they get so open about the tough parts and the reality of having a partner in business. I mean, I can go on and on and they you just need to listen to the end when they talk about the outrageous contest they're going to run and they won't even tell me how to win it. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we will talk about limiting beliefs behind success and how important mindset is. Today, the co-founders of the foundation, Dane Maxwell and Andy Drish, as they say on their site, they have the balls to show you the most intimate parts of their business and are two of the most open and authentic people, so I'm really excited to have them on. Last year, they built a list of 15,000 people in less than three months and got 336 customers to a seven-figure launch. And this year, they have a goal of 1,200 customers. And welcome, guys. Thanks, Thank dude. You. Now, the foundation, just for people out there, the foundation is an online incubator for people who want to build software companies but may not even have an idea to get started and they don't know how to code. And they're on a mission to help a million people get their first customer in business. Is that right, guys? Yeah, we're we're like, we, Dane came to me last week. We were in Boulder, and Dane's like, I was about ready to go into a meeting or something. He's like, Hey, dude, I'm gonna drop a bomb on you real quick. And I was like, Okay, what? And he's like, Can we swear on this? Yeah, go ahead. He's like, I fucking hate our mission. <laughs> so, like, what is the like, new what? mission? Um, you know, we we talked about it a lot, and it seems it seems more ego driven than anything when we say that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, around the number of a million, and really, what we're more interested in is is getting people really connected to their hearts and doing work that matters in the world, and having a blast while they're doing it, having fun. Um, that seems to ring more true to us, like uh, who we are as individuals. Yeah, somewhere along the way, business became more about having fun, and like, screw that, like, let's just have a ton of fun and make a ton of money and align both of them. Say, business became about fun, or no? Somewhere along the line, business became something other than fun like wow. you get into business and like three years later you're not having that much fun but you're just kind of in the motions and you're just kind of like sleepwalking through your business so what did you eliminate in the foundation to make it more fun so far nothing hmm. good question but we should probably maybe el- we should eliminate some stuff yeah it's been really we should eliminate andy, andy. <laughs> <laughs> God, that'd be a lot there's more. some tension here <laughs> i'd be so fucking bored <laughs> Um, you know, we, we talk a lot. We had a real deep conversation last week, and the last two months for us have been uh, has been trying and uh, not fun. Not fun. What about the, it? Uh, it's it's felt really heavy. Like the the work that we've been doing has been like it's it's it feels like a have to or a should as opposed to feeling really inspired um, by what we're doing. And last Thursday night, what what really recentered us and reconnected to us is last Thursday night. <clears throat> About a week prior, we sent out an email and asked, asking people to sh- shoot a short little video telling us why they haven't started a business yet. This is like we got we need to copyright this a little before you say something. Like, go for it. This is this has got to be one of the greatest things we've ever done in our business. And if you're a copywriter, if you want to get reconnected to your purpose, if, if you're in a funk, if you're in a funk, if you want to connect to clarity and certainty and and like be able to feel totally confident and unstoppable, like sit down at a blank page and be able to write a message and know with 100% certainty that it's going to completely resonate with your audience without any doubt so you're not just throwing stuff together, mm-hmm. this is what you do. And we didn't do this with that in mind. What are you laughing about? I'm just laughing at your copy. <laughs> is it good? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So it, it, this is, we didn't do this on purpose. It was like an accident. We we're like just doing this thing to, for our launch video coming up. But then we started watching these videos come in and we we're like, oh my God. We, like, we've been putting copy off for like two months now. Yeah. Like we've been saying, we need to write copy, blah, 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 but we just haven't felt connected. And it, it's really hard to write copy when you don't feel connected. And uh, It's hard to write copy when you're in your head. Yeah. And, and when you get connected to your heart, copy just kind of flows. Just flows. Uh, and you don't have to worry about, you know, I don't know, artificially making stuff up. You just do what you tell what feels true. Yeah. And so third last Thursday night, Dana and I were up till about 2.30 in the morning. And what we we got all these videos back from people shorting, shooting one-minute clips telling us why they haven't started a business yet. 57 videos in total. And we're going through these videos and we're just like, holy shit. Because you hear these examples of people saying, you know, I'd start a business, but I've never had anyone in my life to show me the way or show me the path to get there. Or um, I'd start a business, but I'm so overwhelmed with choices and options. Like, I don't even know what direction to go to. And there are too many people telling me what to do. And I, I just feel overwhelmed with choices. And after, after watching 15 or 20 of these videos, it was just like, holy shit. Um, my favorite ones are the, the fear of failure. This yeah. is, this this uh, kid with glasses comes on and he's like, my parents want me to be a doctor and I want to be an entrepreneur, but if I fail, my parents are going to rub it in my face and I'm terrified. Yeah. And so when we sit down and write copy, we write to that guy. You know, we, yeah. we're talking directly at that guy, that personal guy, and our copy just become it just like pours out of us. But and it becomes fun. But it's more it's more than just having great copy. It's it's being inspired to work again and and working from a place of like uh, excitement. As opposed to like, oh, we have to go. We have to go do this. I mean, uh, you guys too. You both seem like you have a passion for what you do. If you can fall in the funk, anyone can. What made you fall into that funk? Overwhelm. Yeah. More, it, it, when you're focused on one thing, it's pretty fun. When you're focused on like five, it's okay. And when you're focused on ten, it sucks balls. <laughs> We're developing a software product. We're writing five launch videos. We're writing a sales letter. We're building a whole new education platform. We're building a new message board. That's five right off the top of my head. Yeah. And he's got the and he's got the podcast. He's got we're dry, we're doing remarketing and, and retargeting and PPC and we've Google and pretty much been on the road for six weeks straight right now, right? Yeah. And we've got two more to get. Like it's just it's crazy, and you lose connection with what what's really true and what what matters most. I think. Um, I'm excited because in the morning, on t tomorrow when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to picture that kid who like is afraid to tell his parents he wants to be an entrepreneur. That's what's going to – my alarm clock's him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I remember seeing one of your videos and I know you get a lot of questions about tactics. And – but limiting beliefs are what's holding people back most. When did you discover you need to focus on people's limiting beliefs? I, I remember the first time I learned about it. It was at, it was at the day with Destiny with Tony Robbins, hmm. and uh, and he we spent like the entire week. Um, it, it was six days with Tony Robbins in in California somewhere, and we spent the entire like five days uh, up until you're working almost twelve to fourteen hours a day with him, and then you had this three hour window to talk about uh, to recreate like the next version of your life. And I called my girlfriend at the time because I hadn't talked with her often. And she starts like being like, I feel like relationships just hold you back from accomplishing your dreams and just like all of this like really heavy stuff right after he taught us this process of, of limiting beliefs and or how to reverse them, Byron Katie's framework. And I was like, oh, well, is that really true? Like, is that true beyond a shadow of a doubt? And she's <laughs> like, well, no, maybe. And I was like, well, what would the opposite of that statement be? She's like, well, a relationship actually enhances your ability to accomplish your goals and dreams. And I was like, oh, how's that feel? She's like, awesome. Like, <laughs> and that was the first time that I that was the first time I experienced limiting beliefs and how to reverse them. That's cool. Now that doesn't that doesn't kind of answer the question about how do we go from tactics to limiting beliefs. But I fucking love that story. <laughs> it's a good story. Um, I gotta remember that for. Uh, like I forget that how, how awesome it is when you reverse a limiting belief and when Andy tells me that story, I'm like, gosh, it's so cool to do that kind of stuff. Cause you guys might not you guys might not have gone through your journey together had you not done that. Totally. Like a limiting belief could have prevented a beautiful relationship from happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um I was banging my head up against the wall for like a year and a half. They come give a tactic. 
fail, give a tactic, fail, give a tactic, fail, give a tactic, fail, give a tactic, fail, give another tactic, and fail. But like the fifth or sixth time, I'm like, holy shit, something's got to be going on. Is this a student or yep. was it you? Okay. Students. No, that doesn't happen for me. Like, I just see. The... <laughs> Does that sound really bad? Like, I, I just always figure shit out. It just know? always fucking works. No, it doesn't always. We'll doesn't get to always... that part. What's that? We'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Yeah, you can rip that one apart. <laughs> But I just always seem to figure it out. Like, I'm infinitely resourceful for myself. Like, if I run into something, I always figure it out. And anyway, like, I, like my role in the foundation is, like, I'm infinitely resourceful, and the students are, like, infinitely anti-resourceful. <laughs> so, like, they, they run into – they're basically like, oh, I run out of resources all the time, and I'm just, like, feeding them other resources. And the resources at the time were tactics, and then, like, finally by the sixth time, the tactics weren't working. So I was like, what's going on? So, like – I started watching them implement, and then I'd be like, "What did you do that for?" That, like, give me an I, example. What, like, what did someone do that you were like, "Why did you even do that?" Okay, so an idea extraction. Guys, like, "Oh, I can't idea extract. I can't get an idea extracted." And I was like, "Well, let me listen to one of your recorded calls." And so he's on the call, and he's like, "There's like, you know, five questions you ask," and he goes, "He's on like the third question or something," and he asks the question, and the guy's like, "Well." my email box is always just flooded full of emails. And then the guy goes, okay, great. Well, so tell me about the sales operation of your business. And I was like, whoa, no, no, ah, that he just gave you gold. Like he just said his email box is overflowing with what? What are the emails? How many emails does he get a day? What are they about? There's pain inside there, which could be a software product, but you just blew right by it. Why did you blow by it? And he's like, oh, I was nervous because I didn't really want to waste this guy's time. Well, why don't you want to waste his time? Well, I was nervous because I didn't feel like I was good enough to be on the phone. So you mean to tell me that you didn't dig into that email thing because you didn't feel like you were good enough to be on the phone with a business owner. And then like, boom, I was like, okay, let's do some work with that. I see. So the tactical, I mean, you can give them all the tactical things of when you see this, you need to dig in, but their limited belief made them just jump over like a gem of uh, what the business owner was saying. Yeah, not even jump over, just like, I don't know what the right word is. It's like blind. It's like, it's insane. Um, I would say this happens like 80% of the time in the foundation. So what was something, you weren't always like this. What was the limited belief you had from growing up? I was, I came out of the womb like this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention the fun fact yet. So oh. what's your, what's your fun <laughs> fact? <laughs> Perfect timing. Fun uh, fact, um, Dan gave me permission, but he uh, sucked his thumb to, till he was age 12. Yeah. So, so me, maybe you did come out of the womb like this. Let me name the leaf. I have to suck my thumb to feel okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. There might actually be some work to do around that. Now that I think about it. Like, I feel embarrassed and both inspired to work on this at the same time. <laughs> Crap. I'm actually going to look into that. So what from your upbringing do you, did you have? Did, from limited, Do you have any limited beliefs for, before you... You learn this. Yeah, my, my limiting belief is that life is going to be miserably hard and that, like, I'm going to have to fight tooth and nail for everything. And my mom was an amazing mom. She was also just very scarcity driven. And so I remember her telling me that I'd have to fill up my, my jelly jars with water and then freeze them to have popsicles because I wouldn't be able to afford popsicles. I'd use the remnants of a jelly jar. And I was like, oh my God, if I have to do that, a jelly jar is like two bucks. Life must be totally freaking difficult. And Life's a breeze. Like it's not hard. But how did you? Where did that come from? Where did what come from? From her telling you that. Oh, me throwing jelly away when there's some jelly left in the jar. Yeah. Yeah, but so how'd you get over that? I mean, you could have you could have carried that those beliefs, those scarcity beliefs, till you now, and some and a lot of people do. Well, this is one of those beliefs that didn't take four questions to answer. I just got out in the world and I was like, oh, wait, this shit's not nearly as hard as my mom made it out to be. You know? <laughs> was there anything yeah, hard? Experiencing I'll, it. I'll tell you one that was really, that became clear to me recently. Um, <clears throat> when I was three years old, uh, my parents, this, I didn't even know this, this conversation happened until recently. When I was three years old, uh, I, I had, my parents had a, a little girl. So I had a little sister. And uh, being a three year old, it was like, pretty crazy because you're like the center of attention and there's like this other little human being and uh and you're not anymore and so my parents were like oh you have to be you have to be a good big brother and you have to be a role model and you have to like show the way to show the path for your sister um so that she has like big brother to be there for her and so i literally spent the next fucking freaking 
like 25 years or 20, 22 years, 23 years, um, doing everything right, being the good boy, like getting good grades, doing everything perfectly as I could um, because I wanted my sister to have a good life. Uh, and I had no idea that I was operating from that. It was like a belief that was running my life ever since I was three years old. So what was the belief in the sentence? Um, the belief in a sentence that I would have to, uh, that I have to do everything right so that my oh. sister is safe. You can't make mistakes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so like, I always felt like a perfectionist, like, um, always had, yeah, like get for starting a business. That's really hard to get through because you're always trying to do everything right. As opposed to just like going as fast as you can and taking as much action. So you could be like 25 years old, terrified of doing an idea extraction call, terrified of making a mistake, terrified of sending an email and getting a bad, hey, this email's bad back, like scared of all these things and not know that what's really going on is rooted back to age three. And is we that, can tell you all of the emails to send and the subject lines at work and the messages, <laughs> but if you don't if you don't focus on the, the hesitation, like you're always gonna be fighting it. And that's why entrepreneurship is such a cool thing is because it's like a mirror of the world to see the beliefs that you have about the world and the beliefs that you have about yourself. It's like a giant experiment and it's super cool. <laughs> What was one of those students that you had that was just groundbreaking once they discovered one of these limited beliefs? Stanley Lee. Mm -hmm. Tell Stanley. Story. This kid's just... Stanley, if you're watching this, I love you. You, you. you never... I'm looking at the mic. I should look at the camera. He, he never gave up. And so it's about... Stanley's the kind of guy that second guesses everything. You're, you, you really got, you're kind of got Andrew Warner-esque interview skills going on. Like, you're your own flavor. This is really good, Jeremy. All right. I'll, this is a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so Stanley, he's, he's the kind of guy that second guesses everything. So he'll do something and then ask a question, do something and then ask a question. Sometimes not even do something, consider five things and ask a question on which one would be the right thing to do. And so he had, at one point, um, we were at a conference, foundation, foundation conference at the end of the thing when all the successful students met up. And we had a raise your hand if Stanley Lee's asked you a question. The whole room raised their hand and asked a Everyone. question. Even Andy's girlfriend raised her hand and said, Stanley even contacted me. It'll be like Saturday night. I'll be at an ice hockey game and I've got Stanley Foundation saved in my phone because he calls me. But you know, I just love the guy. So I just I just like pick up. He's not supposed to be calling me. He's not supposed to have my number, but I'm like, you know what, whatever. And I pick it up and he's like, Hey Dane, if I got XYZ, do you think I should do X? Yes. Okay, see you later. <laughs> like that's literally the conversation. So about six months in, I finally I'm like, Stanley, what is going on? This BS has gotta stop. You are second guessing yourself all the time. And then I I kind of apply a little of like, I don't know, voodoo magic, if you will, and like I find out like intuitively that something, I feel like something's going on around age 14 with him. So I said, hey, Stanley, did anything happen when you were 14 years old? And he's like, uh, he, uh yeah. And um, something really traumatic happened with his, where he, he, he made his own independent decision and then his mom just like crucified him for it. And so like he was so terrified of making the wrong decision after that point that he couldn't really ever like when it came to making a decision on his own he couldn't do it now he's like 23 in college he's changed his major three times like this blankets everything so he joins the foundation he's doing idea extraction this limiting belief comes up that's completely controlling the rest of his life so anyway we do some limiting belief reversal around that and like fast forward uh, to today he didn't build a software product out of the foundation but he's made somewhere between 10 and 40 grand with the mindset by just building and selling websites to business owners. So you brush over the fact that you just reversed his limiting beliefs from age 14. How did you do that? It's so funny because I'm so like, I'm so present during the situation. I'm so tapped and intuitive and I'm like crying with him. I'm connected to him and I'm like, just like massaging and navigating his emotion that I kind of like, kind of lose sight of the process because I basically follow Byron Katie's four part framework, but um, you know, I say, you know, what, what's going on for you in that moment? Like, where do you feel the energy in your body? And it's like real tight in his chest and terrible in his stomach. Cause when your stomach's tight, it typically has to do with rejection mm -hmm. and rejection from your mom is like super intense. So you're going to feel it in your stomach. And I have him give a voice to his stomach. Like, what's it saying? And it's like, listen to me. It's okay. It's safe. Or like whatever his stomach is saying. And I was like, but what's your chest saying? He's like, no, don't listen to that. It's dangerous. He's got this big piece of like, parts conflicts going in his in his body it's about a 20 minute process 
but typically the biggest thing that needed to happen with Stanley is he just needed to feel the trauma of that pain from his mom because when his mom did that to him his body shut down and he didn't feel the complete circle of that emotion so typically an emotion just needs to go in a complete circle once it's felt in a complete circle it releases from your body but emotions buried alive never die it's actually the name of a book so this emotion stuck in his body so every time he needs to make a decision that age 14 year old emotion comes up and he doesn't even know what it is but the unconscious mind doesn't have any aspects of time so whether it's a day or a hundred years the unconscious mind will fire that emotion off as if it was in that moment so until you feel the complete ferocity and trauma of that emotion go back and feel it to its completion it will control you so I think in Stanley's case we just felt it and he cried a lot and I helped him through that crying and all of a sudden it started kinda of lighting the intensity went from a 10 to a 7 to a 6 down to a 0 and he's like he felt better he felt lighter and then like once that emotion was felt it kinda of corrected in its mind automatically so how do you learn to be so open and vulnerable because this is not easy for most people I would you know I would say especially if you know, the students want to look good with other students and they want to look good for you. How do you guys learn to be so open and get other people to open up and be vulnerable? I've been talking a lot. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it you, you know, they, they've, I think it's followed leader, uh, lead by example. And when, when the leaders of the foundation, I don't know, I hate saying leader, like when the, like when we as the foundation step up and just pour our heart out mm -hmm. and like, you know, I, I say right from the get go, I was like, you know, guys, I really just want you all to like me. Like, it's just so important that I feel liked by you. And I hope that that can be the case. I hope that you like me because it would be so traumatic if you don't. Like, that's really, truly what my heart wants is to be liked and to like others mm -hmm. and love. And so I lead off with that. Mm -hmm. But I just have some sort of like magical thing where when people talk to me, they just gush it all out. And Stanley's, and in Stanley's case, six months into the foundation, six months of all this trauma of like second guessing himself, wait, 14 to like 12 years or whatever of like second guessing himself, he's pretty well ready to open up and get rid of that little beast because it's been running his life for 12 years. So like, you know, when I tell him. Well, I think, I think also it's, uh, <clears throat> the, the foundation is like a container to be safe in. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a culture within the community of being open and being real with each other. And because that container is established, <clears throat> it makes it really easy for people to open up. And, uh, and, and fun and liberating. Yeah. When the person opens up, like they're super nervous and I like, if they're, if they're opening up in front of others, we have the hip chat chat room and I say, hey, can everybody like just give a shout out for Stanley? Like, how are you feeling right now? And everyone's like, oh my God, Stanley, we love you, we love you. Thank you for being so open. This is awesome, I relate to you, I relate to you. And he's got like 30 people just like praising him mm -hmm. for being vulnerable and opening up. Then they just, yeah. The and Dana, it kind of starts with you telling your story about how you're just kind of up, telling him up front, like I just want to be liked. Andy, what do you tell them to kind of open up and be vulnerable? Um, good question. I didn't do as much in the foundation last year in terms of coaching and stuff. Um, it was, it was, last year was weird because it was, we just partnered together in the business last year. Um, we really positioned, like it's Dane's baby last year at some level. Uh, and so he was doing most of the coaching and, and uh, running the community more than I was last year. So what's the tough parts about partnering with each other? Oh God. <laughs> I've had I've had issues in sharing the spotlight. Yeah. So like, you know, gosh, should we tell them about the Brian conversation? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so we have a marriage counselor. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Brian you know, Bear. You know, any any partnership is really like a marriage and yeah. you know, I actually spend more time with Andy than I do my intimate partner. About probably equal. Um Actually, maybe her more, but like, I, like consistently, it's pretty like, close, pretty close. And you know, I told Andy, I was like, you know, Andy, I, I don't really feel like being on camera with you. I, I feel like kind of suffocated. I feel suppressed. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I can be myself. I feel like I kind of want the spotlight, and I feel like you can't hang with me on camera. Mm -hmm. And and like I can just be absolutely direct with him. And then Andy doesn't. Andy's so Andy's so humble and amazing that he's not like. Fuck you, bitch. I'll kick your you ass. You don't take it personally? Well, because there's nothing to take personally. Yeah. It's not um, It's not an issue with me. It's an issue with Dane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all my baggage. Yeah. 
Uh, Andy hangs with me. He crushes me. Like, we crush each other. Like, we're, like, awesome. Like, it's all in my stuff. So I can come, Andy, this is coming up for me, man. I feel like you can't hang with me. What and was then, the most powerful, the best thing about that you learned from therapy that you bring to, like, outside yeah. therapy? Harry, that's funny as shit. Um, well, let's, let's, like, qualify. Who is Brian? Like, <clears throat> Brian Baer is one of the founders of the Authentic Man Program. And the Authentic Man Program, they invented this concept called circling. Have you heard of this at all? Mm-mm, no. It's 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 basically this process where you get into a group of two to four people, maybe more, and maybe eight max. There's there's no you can't talk about anything in the past and you can't talk about anything in the future. All you can talk about is the experience that you're having right now. Mm-hmm. And and what that allows us to do with each other, we we have these conversations maybe once a month once every couple weeks and it allows us to get all of the little stuff that really pisses you off about each other out onto the table because what happens if there's little things that you don't address they all of a sudden they become big things right, and right. then Dan will show up late to a meeting and I'll like freak out on him because he showed up late a handful of times and I didn't say anything because I didn't bring it up and so what we're doing with this space is it, it, it allows us to air all of the baggage that's coming up and then we can figure out is it his is it his stuff that's like screwing it up or is it mine or like what's what's actually happening uh it's really freeing so what was some of the little things for each of you that you were surprised when the other person said wow that bothers you i had no idea well you know that but the conversation comes up before the vegas conference you were like dane like do you even want to do the foundation yeah hmm. telling him i didn't feel he was committed to the foundation and uh, and what we were creating. That was a big one. Mm-hmm. Slapped in the face of that. Why did you think that? Uh, checked out. Yeah, he was checked out. At the time, I was like, I was like organizing this entire fucking Vegas thing, which was a lot of work, and it was just like a a period of there was the whole Vegas thing to do, and we were traveling a lot, and there was just like a lot of things going. This is a common theme for us. A lot of things going on, um, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and so like doing all of that, I was like, dude, what's up? Like, what's going on? Um, that's what brought that one up. And this is all in the context of Brian. So Brian's on Skype with us, and then he like holds a container for us to be real. Yeah. So we don't have to we don't have to actually react to each other. We can kind of like sit there and like see what's actually happening and be like, oh, this is. Like what's what am I experiencing right now versus trying to like react instantly to what he says. So Dane, how'd you get your mojo back? It's weird. The conversation itself was like really shifting. Yeah. Just just, just getting it out in the open. Yeah, yeah, it was one of the first times we started using Brian. Was it was in April or May. Yep. And uh and the more that we do, the easier that it becomes. That's what's really fun. Is that the the more of those tough conversations where you're kind of pushing your edge, the easier those really direct hard conversations to have become. Um, Amen. And I think the mojo actually just came back full circle as of like three days ago. Like yeah. other like otherwise I've just been doing as much as I can with my own inertia. But I feel like God's got my back now, or the universe has got my back, and I'm just like just being pulled forward now because I walked into Andy and I was like, I'm gonna drop a bomb. I fucking hate our vision, and like. I was like, fun, yeah, love, entrepreneurship, like groundedness. Like now I'm like, yes, I was actually just driving in the car, going back from yoga on the way. I don't do yoga a lot, but just like this one time this year. Um, <laughs> and like we're in the car and like I hear the radio and I was like, gosh, I want the starting from nothing podcast to be on the radio everywhere. It's like I'm picturing this radio ad and it's like these entrepreneurs are got into their hearts and said, fuck you to the system. Like they started from nothing. They had absolutely nothing. They lacked everything and now they're where they're at. Like go come be inspired by the foundation. Like and I picture that going like all over the world. But like when we had like a million entrepreneurs with their first customer, wham, wham. It's like, you know, <laughs> like just, <laughs> yeah, like puking You have to myself. start somewhere though, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Totally. That's totally. a good point. Like, yeah, yeah, we start shit and we get gold. And iterate. Yeah. <laughs> so what? You can't polish a turd, but like you can like, <laughs> never mind. You know, I don't think it... I could see your point of though putting a metric on it so people get inspired of like a million, you know? Yeah. I mean, can they wrap their brain around I just want a fun loving business? Yeah, well, we, we have haven't still need we have, we're, we don't have clarity on what we definitely want a metric in place still. Yep. And what I what I did notice from having 
um, a big vision is that you attract big people into your life. Yes. When you want to do something big in the world, somehow you end up being surrounded by other people who are doing big things in the world. Uh, so we definitely want to have some sort of big net metric that is measurable. We're not sure what that is yet, um, but it's definitely a lot of a deeper connection than just having people get their first customer. Yeah. And it, it could be a, it could be a hundred a hundred or a million entrepreneurs connected to their hearts. It won't be that, but you know you know something more. Something more like that, like a hundred entrepreneurs, like alive about what they're doing in the world. We're not, we're not sure, but it's not, it's, it's not a work in progress. Yeah. yeah, I mean, whenever I watch you guys' interviews and I think about it, one big question I always think about is why, why do you stay in Iowa? You could live anywhere. Great question. We just had a very real debate about this last week too. <laughs> Iowa feels amazing. I love Iowa. It's. I have a 3,500 square foot home with like five amazing dudes that live in it, a pool, a hot tub, three car garage, all the space I could ask for. The mortgage is 1,800 bucks a month. Uh, can't I don't even, beat that. I, can't, I don't even pay the mortgage. I'm, I'm less than 10 minutes away from anything I need to be to. There's never rush hour traffic. The quality of life is amazing. And Forbes magazine just named Des Moines as one of the top cities to, for entrepreneurs in the country. But before now, I remember hearing before it was lonely. Yeah. So why do you end up staying? I mean, that's now, but before it wasn't like that. Good questions. I like, like this. Well, you know, I think that, well, I have, if, if I didn't have the house with guys in it, I would be pretty damn lonely. Uh, but like, you know, there's a kind of a bustling community here. It's, it's not like, it's hard to find people as awesome as Andy. Like Andy's in Boulder. But he come with you? No, Andy lives in Boulder. Oh, you I, live in Boulder. Oh. I grew up, I grew up in Iowa and uh, I spent seven years here in Des Moines. <clears throat> and I, I still love coming to, we're in Des Moines right now. I love Des Moines. Uh, for a place to live, it's not for me right now. Um, yeah, it's just not. Because I thought you were roommates, that's why I made that assumption. Because I remember listening at some point, you were roommates at some point, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. a couple weeks ago. Could be roommates again, who knows? Maybe, uh, no, unless you come to Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> so why actually, Boulder over Iowa? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the road five or six months out of the year and geez, really that much. Yeah. What right are you now. doing on the road? Oh, fucking events. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't we gotta, know. We got to go to some stupid mastermind group. We're not going to name it, but like... well, it's not, it's not stupid. It's good. It's actually, it's just a lot. Uh, yeah. A lot of events. It seems like, um, and it's not, you know, we were in Chicago and Vegas and Chicago and Des Moines and then Burning Man for two weeks and now we're here in Des Moines for three days and then New, New York. York for five days and then Boulder for three, two days and then Austin for two days. It's just like a lot. Um, and so when I'm home, I want some place that's like a sanctuary where I can just be really relaxed and have a ton of convenience and still have, you know, good restaurants and good people and that Boulder's it for me. So how do you motivate your students, especially like, like internally when you guys have, you know, hitting roadblocks, maybe as a partnership, what's the best way you have found to motivate your students? Hmm. I don't know. The best, the best motivation for students doesn't actually come from us, I think. It actually, they do it on their own. Um, or the students, the students who make the most progress don't need, don't necessarily need motivation from hmm. us. Beautiful. The, the students who make the most progress in six months have a very, very strong why in their life, mm -hmm. and they're connected to that on a daily basis. Carl Mattiola was probably one of our top students. He went from having no idea and no like way to start a business to six months later um, quitting his job at Tesla Motors, where he used to work. And <clears throat> he had a why statement that he wrote that was a page long and he would read that every single morning mm -hmm. and then he would read that every morning and then he would take an hour of action every single morning um and it was all because he was really connected to his own purpose mm -hmm. and our top students don't they don't necessarily need motivation from us i want to ask about the big why but but on that you do create the community you mm -hmm. do create that community so what do you do to create the community because the community is motivating but you actually created community truth they kind of self-organize themselves as well we put them in time zones we put them in like different geographic locations so they can meet up in person we give them like challenges or whatever but that's a good question I mean you're helping us brainstorm for this next year because you know like we'll probably have like for example failure Fridays 
where like everyone celebrates all the failures that they had. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, nice job. I failed 16 times this week. And everyone's like, hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, celebrating the failures instead of just the successes. So along the way, they, yeah. Yeah, honestly, the community is really motivating for people. One of uh, <clears throat> Josh, Josh Isaac, he had $20,000 in pre-sales, 80 customers or something That's in great. six months. And he, what shifted for him, I interviewed him, and he said the moment that shifted everything for him is he went to the community and he's like, I'm just feeling really bad today. I think he was making idea extraction calls or something. I'm feeling really yeah. bad. And, uh, and Mitch Bowler goes to Josh and he says, dude, I give you permission to be outrageous in your life. And having somebody there to like support him through those like tough times mm-hmm. just opened up the floodgates for him um, to really move forward in a unique way. And so uh, honestly, I think a big part of what makes the community amazing is the marketing that we do ahead of time. It attracts the right type of people. Yeah, and your marketing is telling people that they can be vulnerable and they can be open and they can celebrate their, their failures. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Um, so what is some of the strong wives that people have? And did it help you solidify yours when you're you know, going through and, and getting more students for the foundation? I think with... <clears throat> I don't know any of the students' wives. Yeah. I don't know any exactly. What about yours? What are your strong wives? Uh, <clears throat> we just started, we worked with a person about a month ago to get really clear on this for us as individuals. And for me, uh, my entire reason for existence Mm -hmm. is to be a stand for people to become the most ultimate version of of themselves possible. Uh, And this all stems back when I was in second grade. I had this teacher, Miss Dickey, and I wrote this short story. And she submitted this story to a contest and I ended up winning this contest. And it was the first time anyone in my life ever took a stand for me for like who I could become and what I could do mm-hmm. uh, and believed in me before I believed in myself. Mm-hmm. And so I just imagined living in a world where everyone has somebody like that in their lives. Uh, and that's what the foundation like represents to me at some level. So what is, what is someone, have you gotten that at all so far? What's that? With anyone, like someone said that about you? It's kind of ironically, some one way the foundation started, like, uh, <clears throat> Dane, we met, we met in 2008 and I was working in corporate America and he was, he was running his first recruiting website at the time and we met here in Des Moines. I had spent two years trying to blog and, and, uh, and get something off the ground and then Dane was the first person that I met that was like that one or two steps ahead of me of like holy shit, like somebody my age or close to my age who's making money running a business, not doing this internet thing that's about page views and subscribers but actually running a business uh, and so he started teaching me all this stuff about direct response marketing and copywriting and after about a year it, it shifted my life so much I was like dude you have to fucking teach this stuff and he was really hesitant towards it at the beginning and uh, and then eventually I just went to Mixergy and submitted like s- sent this thing to Andrew being like hey man you've got to interview this guy here's his story um, do you remember this? yeah yeah and, uh, and thanks, that, for, thanks for doing that yeah, you're welcome, man. I'm so glad I did. <laughs> Why were you hesitant, Dan, at the time? Um, well, one of the limiting beliefs that I had was that I had to, I had to cheat the system to be successful. Um, and so, in other words, if I was successful, I was just a luck. Um, and even though I had kind of repeatedly done what I had done about two or three times. And, and no matter how hard or many times I was successful, I still had that in the back of my mind. So I didn't want to be exposed to the public because I feel like I would feel like a fraud because I felt like I cheated the system to be successful. But I've since then cleared that thing. So I didn't clear it at the time. I just I just uncomfortably went on Mixergy. Um, but I I just recently cleared that thing like three or four months ago. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, so it was just your internal chatter, really. Yeah. Because I mean, you had created a successful company or businesses it was just you telling yourself that you were not um, you know you weren't ready or up to par yeah so what um, what were you nervous about when you went on the interview on the first Mixergy interview everything because you wouldn't if you watched that you wouldn't be able to tell yeah yeah if you watch the very first interview and I got that like blue plaid striped shirt on I'm dressed up as nice as I would usually go out to a bar <laughs> yeah I got my Dane just got back from working out now <laughs> yeah I got like my yeah 
I got back from working out. I just jumped in the pool and then, like, came to the interview, you know? Like, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. But Thanks for that, dressing up for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that's not about you. Remember, that's about me. That's so true. You, you that's true. Things. You're right. Yeah. That's so, my own issue. That's my own <laughs> issue. I like to be liked. <laughs> it's important, man. So, like, I, uh, you know, I think I had my girlfriend at the time, like, do my hair. And, you know, I set up in, the, in my room, like, so it could face my desk. And so it would, like, be up looking down at me so I could feel a little more powerful. Like, hmm. All this stuff, and at the very beginning of the interview, like Andrew Warner's like, Dean, what do entrepreneurs focus on? And I'm like, leads and profit. And my voice is really low because that's my nervous voice. Oh, yeah, you can, if you know me, you can tell. I watched that yesterday, and I'm thinking it's such a difference between we're talking about limited beliefs. In that first interview, you're like, you just got to get leads, you have land, you know, very tactical, very tactical. Yeah. yeah, oh my gosh, you're so right. And so it's very interesting. So you know, you're just you just moved up like it's not like Maslow's hierarchy, but like something is is moved up um, in your mindset, I guess. Yeah, I'm glowing right now because of that reflection. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, what is your big why now? For me, I I lost sight of how kind and gentle my spirit is naturally. I I was homeschooled till seventh grade. And then my heart was just like open and like tender and loving and soft. And then I went to seventh grade and just got like, poof, fucking destroyed. Junior by- high does that to most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm happy it happened to you guys too. Sorry, but like, yeah, like I am. It makes me feel like it's I'm so like, awkward. It's an awkward stage for everyone. I feel. Yeah. yeah. Well, to have to have your heart not prepared by your parents. Now, hey, Dane, when you go into public school, guard your heart. Like they didn't say that, you know. Um, and that would have been really helpful because I just went to open heart like to every group and just got hammered, hammered, hammered. Before long, like the loving homeschool boy that like helped old grandmas carry their groceries to their car wasn't doing that anymore. Really? And, like, so that changed you? Because I would think that's great. They shouldn't shield you. They should keep you as the, the loving person you are. Why, why did try and harden you? That did change you. Well, no, my parents, if they said guard your heart, they wouldn't have hardened me. They uh-huh. would have just told me to guard my heart. Um, in other words, I had just had like real life reality just beat me into the ground, my heart into the ground and like that was very traumatic. So anyway, like I was really kind and loving and like soft and gentle and like, you know, just very sweet and then it just got just destroyed and pummeled. But anyway, we can, like so anger has really driven most of my life. Most of my self-talk has been anger and when I say like someone said like what would you say entrepreneurship is and I said I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't the answer to you feeling uh, the opposite of worthlessness because for me everything in my life had done I've done to avoid the feeling of worthlessness um, get a really good girlfriend build lots of businesses make money get a house like also I can avoid the feeling of worthlessness um, and that voice inside my head is always angry and critical like you gotta do this you worthless piece of shit who the fuck do you think you are like really angry voice talking to myself like so bad and Anyway, I just didn't realize that like that's poisoning my body and what like my personal freedom is in kindness, and freedom is kindness and kindness is freedom. Uh, and you see, you could have financial freedom, but if you're not kind to yourself and loving to yourself, both in the way you think and talk to yourself, and then ultimately because of the way you talk to yourself and talking to others, then I don't really think you're free at all. So when you consider like how do you start this business? How do you make the sales call? How do you approach that beautiful woman? How do you do any of those things like? kindness playfulness like you go with you go in with that like let kind like if you're at a conference and you're like trying to meet people and you're kind of insecure like who can I look at who can I look out for like well you're fine as you are you don't need to go anywhere just be kind to who you are and then like go to other people and just be kind and say hey how are you like where are you from like that's kindness so anyway the foundation for me is a vehicle to propel kindness into the world kindness to yourself kindness to others and the foundation for Andy is the vehicle for him to help uh, people become the ultimate version of themselves. So with kindness and this ultimate version of themselves is like this freaking awesome force. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Who are your mentors? Who would you consider one of your most influential mentors? My mentors came from books. Which books? Where would your mentors come from? Mm. Yeah, like the first one that comes to mind, the person... <clears throat> who's had probably influenced both of us, maybe not the most, but at a significant level, Evan Pagan. 
We just I somehow up. knew you were gonna say that. I don't know. Yeah. I watched. Oh, I watched the interview you did with him. Yeah. It, we just studied yeah. so much of his stuff. Yeah. Like from business to time management to pickup, like everything, and it's uh, it's incredible. Um, yeah, he was a big one. So what sticks out in his message to you when you think of what you learned? What's like the biggest piece of advice that sticks in your head? Hmm. I think Eben was more resonant with Andy, um, well, maybe with me. For me, yeah, my mentors were Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham, mm-hmm. Chet Holmes, Eben Pagan. And when I was starting out in my basement, I was alone for about a year. And like, I've had the fledgling four hour work week book and the fledgling Dan Kennedy book. And that's really all I had to base my reality on because the rest of the world was not how I wanted to live. So I had these two books that would explain the reality I wanted to live. And it wasn't until I started connecting to the source of these things monthly through like monthly audio interviews or monthly newsletters or Mm -hmm. like the monthly digestion of content for me from these top mentors is what like me for about a year started my confidence in what I knew and what I could be just skyrocketed by that positive reinforcement from these mentors. Because the mentor, otherwise my mentors would have been like, get your name out there, get business cards, Mm -hmm. get a logo, get a website, then go make money. Like that's what the average advice was, and those could have been my mentors, but that just felt off to me. What about your emotional mentors? Because Dan Kennedy is definitely not your emotional mentor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is probably why we stopped reading his stuff. <laughs> yeah, I cut him off completely. <clears throat> it's terrible. You're talking about kindness, but I, I would not categorize. I don't know him personally, but I've definitely read his material. I wouldn't. Um, he's just a cranky old man. That's how it's yeah, he's unhappy. So what about your kindness mentors? Because that's that's more the place here and now. Yeah, that's why Evan resonated with me so well. Oh, are you serious? I you thought you were going to take Andy off camera because uh, <laughs> you wanted to be alone. <laughs> no, can, you, can you read that quote right here? No. <laughs> so it says, to live with care and kindness is all that is necessary. The rest reveals itself in due time. Mm-hmm. Dr. David Hawkins. So that's one of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because when I, when I reached out to Dion and he uh, emailed me, I was a little bit surprised by his response. So I was like, oh, what are you guys reading lately? And he's like, yeah, they're not really reading marketing or business books. They're focusing on deep emotional work. So tell me, what are you, what are you guys focusing on now? Okay. Um, man. Andy's reading stuff. I'm just doing output. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I just started reading The Alchemist again. Love that. Uh, yeah. Incredible book. And then... uh. What I was reading before that was re- reading more of uh, Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now. Mm. Um, Is that one good? It's incredible. It's uh, awesome. Ram Dass was Timothy Leary's partner in the 70s. Timothy Leary was the dude who did all the experimentation with LSD. And, uh, and the book is... It's it's fun because it's got like a story element of like when he was on his journey as a story, and then he's got um, some stuff around when they were tripping on LSD, and then he has all these poems and stuff around truths of the universe, and oh. it's a really really incredible book. It sounds badass. Yeah. So really, really everything everything for me uh, at this point in my life is around getting grounded um, in my own truth and and living and expressing what's true to me. So what have you found that is work to, to help someone create their ultimate self? Like what, what do you tell people? Because that's it's hard to do. Yeah. I don't think you actually tell people anything a lot of the times. Generally, it starts with more questions. Okay. Um, and like questions on helping them understand their own reality. Mm-hmm. Maybe at, at times you have to step into this energy of like telling people. When, when we were in Vegas, um, I did like a 45-minute coaching session with Carl Mattiola. Uh, and, and I was like, dude, when are you going to quit your job? Cause his business was doing like two to three grand a month. He was working at Tesla where he was like 95% happy, which is like a dangerous trap to be in. That's probably worse than working at McDonald's or something because it's so easy to rationalize. He had like a lot of money in stock options and stuff that he could wait for two years and it could vest and he would, you know, make a lot of money from it, but he'd also have to piss away two years of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I asked him a lot of questions around that of like, okay, Carl, so what really shifted it for Carl? Cause I asked at the end of the coaching session, he decided he was quitting his job. And, um, and before Andy, he wasn't stepped into the ultimate version of himself. Yeah. He was like shrunken. He couldn't see it. 
because he couldn't see you like the next step. And so I asked him, uh, I was like, okay, Carl, so imagine yourself um, uh, three months from today, six months from today, 12 months from today, um, and imagine yourself still working at Tesla and we're back here in Vegas a year later with next year's foundation class and you're still working there, um, how do you feel? And we th when he thought about a year later, how would he feel, um, it, everything shifted for him. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him three months later, six months later, 12 months later, imagine you quit your job and imagine you tried running this business. A year later, how do you feel? And he's like, you know what? Worst case scenario, even if the business fails, I will feel so much better about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in that moment where he's like, okay, I'm quitting my job next month. And so I had him, I had my email up and I was like, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to, uh, <laughs> Imagine you're writing your, a letter to your boss resigning. Uh, what would you write? And he wrote it in my email inbox. And I was like, perfect. And I saved it. And I was like, what day are you quitting? He's like, June 15th. And I was like, great. June 16th, if you don't put your two weeks notice in, I'm sending this email to your boss. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, after that, everybody was hanging out in like the foyer of the, or the main room at the, at the suite. And I was like, okay, are you ready to go tell everyone? And, uh, and right after that, because when you make a decision like this, you're in a specific state when you're in it and you have to make a decision, you have to take an action that's going to like cement that and concrete that into your mind. So he went out in the room, he's like, all right, everybody, I've got an announcement to make. Um, and he announced to everybody in Vegas that day that in four weeks, he's putting his two weeks notice in a Tesla. And that's the reason he did it. Um, and so that's like, it doesn't always come from telling people, it generally comes from yeah. asking questions yeah. and helping them see yeah. um, and just yeah. believing in them. I think the world is starving for somebody to believe in them because they have so many people that are like, their parents say they can't do it and their friends think they're crazy and they're just starving for somebody to be like, man, I really see the potential in you and I know you can do this if you want to. So what are some big mistakes that you made with the first foundation that you'll make sure to include or not include in the, in the next version? Spending all of our time on marketing and 90% of our time on marketing and 10% of our time on the product. Like what in the product will you be like, Products. we need this? The product was just unorganized. Um, it was we, more than unorganized. It was off. Well, I mean, it wasn't awful. It kind it of was awful. awful. Yeah, it was awful. It was awful product. We, we launched last year uh, and basically we did all this incredible work and then the day that we launched, uh, the next six weeks were hell. Um, our membership site wasn't tested. There were bugs in it. We didn't have that much content ready to go. Um, our merchant accounts froze money. Like just everything you can imagine going wrong went wrong. Uh, and so this year we're spending a lot of money and investing close to a hundred grand yeah. into uh, building out custom software, um, hiring coaches to have all this content built ahead of time, hiring Peter Schaller, the Shrink for Entrepreneurs, to train coaches so they're certified. And yeah, I chatted with him. He's a great guy. Uh, yeah. He's incredible. Um, and we're investing so much time into making an incredible product this year. It's just going to be, it's going to be really amazing. You're obviously, you know, experts at creating software products. So what do you make sure to not include in the first version? And what do you make sure that's like top, you know, that's essential to include? Hmm. Well, like one of the things we want to have in the platform is like gamification. So badges. So when you've completed five tasks, you get the five task badge. If you've got 20 likes on all of your status updates, because um, people really like the stuff you're sharing, then you get like the 20 likes badge. And you know, we had to create names for this that we haven't thought through yet. The gamification thing obviously doesn't need to be built if the software platform is not going to be used. So what's the bare minimum we can get away with, but people will still use the platform? So you go with like your ideal. And then you strip down to like, do you, is this feature dependent on the success of the, like, like gamification is only valuable if the program is successful. So that's how you know how to cut the feature. Yeah, because I remember watching an interview with you, Dane, and you said, you know, this guy was telling you all these things and you just said, okay, what's the one or two things you need? And then he gave you those one or two things and you're like, why didn't you just tell me? I didn't need all these 15 things, you know? <laughs> and so that's why I'm wondering what you are making sure to include because you know it's going to work for your for your members, you know. Uh, I was much smarter back then. I, that was a really <laughs> good question. <laughs> so, I have one last question for you guys. I appreciate your time, but before I ask it, um, and, and before you do, like, yeah, 
you can ask us more. Like, <laughs> like you don't have to ask us one last one. Like, Andy and I, are, our wives are very deep. So, like, we know it's 8.52 p.m. on a Friday. We do have to end at 9. So it's, we not, have, it's not Friday. It's Monday. Monday. Thank you. Every day feels like Friday. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> part of me hates you for saying that, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> fun to me like you know I, I was actually just having the epiphany I was like you know you know like the things that you kind of accidentally discover you really enjoy like you do all these things you're like well I think I enjoy this thing over here like Andy and I were doing all this marketing content all just creating products but then we we did this is our third interview we've done today and like I'm like wow you know interviews are pretty fun what if we just freaking sat and talked all day like we don't have to do anything it's <laughs> like so like uh, this is fun as shit because well, I do have a few more questions, so let me ask you them. You gave, you gave me, you, you gave me approval for this. So, what is the worst advice you've each gotten? That from someone you respect, not from someone you're like, oh, I don't care what they think. You know, someone you really valued their opinion. Uh, my uncle, uh, Rob Spearman, uh, told me to become a real estate agent and told me to get my name out there. And I believed him and tried that. It sucked. Why was it bad though? Because some people do are successful real estate agents and get their name out there. Because I'm a direct response marketer and I get people's names into me. I see. <laughs> well, that's from you studying. Your early mentors were all like heavy copywriters. Yeah. How did you even get turned on to those people? The warrior form. Gosh, I cringe and hesitate to say that. <laughs> I was on the Warrior Forum, and then like Willie Crawford released an interview with John Reese, and then John Reese is like, you know who I study? Perry Marshall. That guy's really good. So I went to Perry Marshall, and then Perry Marshall. I went to Dan Kennedy, and through Dan Kennedy, I went. Mm -hmm. And you know, Andy and I read all these like, be present, be loving, be emotional <laughs> books. Like, <laughs> funny how I say that. Like, but at the time. When we needed to, we read the hard-hitting copywriting direct mm -hmm. response. But now that we've got that, like our evolution is now on this path of books. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll go back to them. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes we'll go back to them. I don't see it happen often. But so, Andy, what about you? What's the worst piece of advice? You know, I was I was just thinking about this. Uh, I remember when Dane gave me some really terrible advice. I remember, do you remember when uh, there was the the first like real info product I spent money on was this course called Arbitrage Conspiracy? You remember this? Yeah. Um, this was probably what five months into knowing each other or something, six yeah. months into it, and I was like, I was like thinking of like, well, what should I do? I don't know ideas and stuff. And he's like, oh, I just saw this course. It looks fucking incredible. It's arbitrage conspiracy, and it's all about arbitrage. So how to, uh, you know, oh, buy? Yeah, buy, <laughs> I want to leave the room. Right I know, now. <laughs> I <bet you> do. <laughs> fucking terrible advice. <laughs> how to how to buy like pay per click ads at, uh, you know. 10 cents a click or something and then drive them drive people to a web page full of other Google Ads AdSense ads where you make mm -hmm. like a dollar a click. Um, and or you know doing CPA ads where you do pay per click to a CPA thing and then you make money each time you get a acquisition or a lead for people. And I spent like a grand and split a product with this guy and after like 2 weeks or 3 weeks um, all it was was like you find a bunch of affiliate offers and you try and run ads to them and it was just like the most soul sucking awful just is it it's like is this what i really have to do to like build a business is sell my soul and mm. do do mind numbing awful work that just feels bad but that's he, did something, have, he did have some he did have some success though i think it was valuable for you to go through Oh, totally. Um, you, you all had, you had, all of that stuff is valuable to go through. What was that I, offer that you had that worked? Snuggies? Snuggies, yeah. I, was, Snuggies. I ran ads for Snuggies and made some money. What's for Snuggies? Snuggies? What's a Snuggie? <laughs> oh, my God. You need this in your show notes. It's the blanket. <laughs> oh. Do you remember, do you remember the you commercials? Fit your arms in or something? Yeah, where they uh, see people at, like, football games and stuff. They're terrible. But then I, I watched it. It was cool because I remember watching it, like, researching it all. And there was a guy in uh, Chicago who did the uh, – the ultimate Chicago pub or the ultimate Snuggy pub crawl in Chicago, and he did this like pub crawl thing, organized it with hundreds of people, and then had an affiliate link to Snuggies, and then he made, you know, money each time somebody. I was obviously it. not a part of that uh, pub crawl in Chicago. No, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a great idea. Um, uh, but um, whole, whole process to go through terrible advice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's sometimes those painful things that we go through that drives us. What do you so, remember any of those? Almost all the time. 
Yeah. You know, I remember Almost every every time you have pain, it ends up being a blessing after you get through it, you know, a year, two years, five years. Um, but it sucks at the time. Yeah. So I wanted to hear more about what you are excited about the foundation recently. And then I will ask my last question. Tell me what you're excited about. You got it. What should people know about it? Go for it. I'm excited to make the foundation the Alcoholics Anonymous of starting companies. Um, not in the not in the sense of like, you know, st stop drinking alcohol. But do you know the original creator of Alcoholics Anonymous? No. No. Yeah. I don't want you to know that me or Andy either. No. Um, and so the the foundation is really a symbol for starting from nothing and a symbol that says you can have what you want and you can mm -hmm. start regardless of any circumstance so this year uh, I am only teaching idea extraction because that's just what I'm best at I'm not really good at building info packs and pre-selling and, 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 and building the product I'm good at it myself but like I don't I'm not nearly as good at teaching it as yeah, I am idea I extraction so, yeah so we're bringing back our successful students who are the best in each category to teach those modules and I think in the next two years, I might not even be teaching any modules in the foundation. So it's, and, and, and you know, the foundation will be such a better program because I won't be in it. You're specializing in one thing that you're best at yep. within it. What's, what's most exciting for me is that we're just, we're playing a whole different game of business at this point um, than we were last year. Last year was all about marketing. You know, how big can we do our launch? How can we grow our list from nothing to, you know, 15,000 people in three months, like all of that. And this year, our teams at like 10 to 15 people, um, we're stepping in, we're just, we're playing at a totally different level and the game is changing in a really big way. Uh, it's not so much about marketing for me anymore, it's more about getting the right team members on board, making sure they have what they need, um, and really building building a company that's gonna stand the test of time. Like something that is a living, breathing entity that is totally separate from us or and like any one individual person and it's super super exciting and challenging and hard and all the above yeah I can see in a year or two we won't be in any videos either that would be just like a dream come true for us to like you know we're trying to get into entrepreneur magazine right now but if we get in we don't want to be in it we want one of our students yeah to be on the cover of entrepreneur yeah. Mag. yeah and oh, I'm gonna say something else really cool but I forgot that's what I noticed about a lot of your blog posts, though. That's what the feature is. I mean, the spotlight is on the students and the student success and what they're doing and what, you know, kind of, you could see that group work with the person on stage and everyone kind of, you know, you can tell there's that camaraderie, you know. Oh, yeah. What, what do you notice from them? Do you see those videos then? Mm -hmm, mm hmm What do you, do you like them? Yeah, I mean, the, the infographics are interesting. You know, <laughs> I mean, that catches your eye right away. Too. Because it's not your typical post, you know what I mean? Huh. It's yeah. like colorful and you know it kind of weaves through a story, and it's not what you're typically used to when you're going to a blog post. So, do you like it? You, I like the you know get, you could always relate to. I like the vulnerability. You know what I mean? You can relate to that person's real story, like the lumber, the woman lumberjack. You know what <laughs> I mean? Yeah. And the fact that I remember that is a testament to it. You know, it's those stories that people are sharing because you can relate to that. You know, yeah. you know that. Go ahead, Senior. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, one of the things we're, con we're uh, excited about right now, Jeremy, is we're doing a contest this year. Oh, yeah. This is super. Yeah. This is great. And so, um, for our contest, I'm giving away one of my businesses for a year. Um, so I'm partnering up with someone for a year to run one of my businesses and they're going to get training from me and my team to run one of my software businesses and get 50% of the profits. So how do you win? Question. <laughs> <laughs> you'll know in about three weeks. Yeah, you'll know in about three weeks. We're still ironing that out. We're still getting all the details. Yeah. It's, it's fun to do. It's really fun to do. Like, it's fun to ask the questions of like, what's the craziest, most exciting, mind-blowing thing that we could do? Mm -hmm. And then figure out the answer and go do it. So what did it win? Uh, plane tickets, cash. iPad. iPad. Our top 10 business books. Uh, terrible idea. And the order to read them in. Yeah. What was <laughs> one that was over the top that didn't make it because it was too, too good? 
the one we're giving away. This one. <laughs> oh, this was the one. Okay. This was like this was like the craziest thing we could like. What if we gave away a business? Like I mean, this is gonna cost me you... tens of thousands of dollars yeah. to give away this part the fifty percent of profits. And it's 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 incredible. But it's all in support of our vision. Like tens of thousands of dollars or more entrepreneurs having fun in their heart. Like mm -hmm. So where do people go? Tell people where to go to find more. Go well, right. Jeremy Chiropractic is. <laughs> I'm gonna get a flood of people on my list, like fifteen thousand people. <laughs> Have you noticed your chiropractic business get any better because you do this? Of course. I mean, uh, communication-wise, and just um, it definitely helps. Sure. Thefoundation.com. Thefoundation.com, and how did you get that domain name? Because huh. it used to be IO. Right? Yeah, I I bought it from the dude that owned it. Obviously. <laughs> did you have to use like a super like persuasion technique or did you just say, I'm just going to... I wish there was a cool story, but he didn't Cash. want it. I <laughs> just cool asked story. him if he'd sell it. My last question is, I know you have to go. What, are the, what do you spend the first part of your day doing? I always wonder this. Like the first hour of your day, what's that look like? When I'm happy with how I spend it? When it's like the best use of time? Writing. So you get up and just write? I don't know. When, I, when it's my good days, I do. And bad days? Bad days, I get up and react to shit. Yeah. Like email? You mean check email or what do you mean? I don't ever check email. I'm talking about like, you know, you got the software product. You got all this stuff in Basecamp. You've got a calendar. You've got the I've made a series. You've got like... So like if you're not like proactive about the first thing you're doing and like right. that first thing, like my highest value thing when I'm writing, I'm on fire. So, so if it's writing video scripts, if it's writing emails, if it's writing the sales letter, if it's writing content, if it's writing educational material, all of my certainty and purpose comes from writing, I think. If I like on my perfect mornings, uh, I would start with like a five to ten minute like grounding meditation, uh, go on a run or swim and come back and have a green smoothie and like All right. that's that's like a perfect morning for me and that happens not nearly as what's often. in the green smoothie oh all sorts of stuff um a green uh, an athletic greens a uh, reds product protein almond butter chia seeds flax seeds spinach uh strawberries bananas almond butter yeah if you google search evan pagan's green drink on youtube he's got like his old badass drink it's like it's just freaking awesome. Like, um, I, I like I like to do all that stuff too. But I was just answering like when work starts. That's what I thought you were gonna say, Dan. I thought you were gonna say some crazy fruit smoothie drink. Do you do you... <laughs> nothing like that? I love like coconut milk, chocolate protein powder, and then peanut butter. Mm. Is that what you're drinking? Are you drinking like coconut milk now? What is that? Oh, that was almond milk with oh. cookie with cookie debris in it. We're dipping <laughs> cookies in it. <laughs> well. Guys, I appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure, and uh, I'm looking to seeing the new uh, foundation. Thanks, brother. Catch you later. <laughs>